to our talk entitled um, Improving Coastal Resilience in the Gulf South Through Academic Service Learning. Uh, the title of this talk is slightly different than the one in the conference program. Um, and, and the reason for that really is that um, the initiative that Rachel and I are working on, which we'll reference at the end of our talk today, um, has been somewhat delayed in getting off the ground. So we want to situate that um, future project uh, in relation to the work that Rachel and I have been doing for the past several years at the University of, Mid uh, at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and get started. So, okay. Um, unbeknownst to many outside of the state of Mississippi, the University of Southern Mississippi is a multi-campus institution. USM's flagship campus is located in Hattiesburg, but there are several additional teaching sites spread across the three coastal counties of Southern Mississippi. You see those here with the Southern Miss um, Golden Eagle icons along the coastline. In September 2019, as part of an ongoing institutional reorganization, USM's then president and provost unveiled a unified vision for the future-oriented integration of these coastal sites, including the USM Gulf Park campus in Long Beach, Mississippi, where Rachel and I both teach. That vision is for USM's coastal operations to become, quote, a national leader in addressing issues relevant to people in coastal and maritime settings. And in support of this vision, the president and provost approved three foundational pillars, understanding the oceans and coasts, improving coastal resilience, and supporting the blue economy, which would guide the development and integration of coastal-oriented academic programming across these three sites moving forward. Although we focus our attention in this study on measuring changes in environmental attitudes among USM's student population enrolled in service learning coursework, we consider the aspirational projects of improving regional environmental attitudes and improving socio-environmental resilience as fundamentally interconnected and mutually reinforcing. The crucial interrelationship between these two constructs is painfully evident in the Gulf Coast region of the United States where culturally prominent anti-environmentalist attitudes coexist alongside and arguably contribute to the recent history of spectacular socio-environmental disasters. Uh, the list of such recent disasters includes Hurricanes Katrina, Harvey, and Laura, as well as the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010 and the less publicized Nurdle spill that occurred along the banks of the Mississippi River in New Orleans in 2020. Following USM's publicized plans for coastal reorganization, including increased curricular and co-curricular emphasis on improving coastal resilience, Rachel and I, alongside several other colleagues, set out to investigate the collective impact of environmentally focused academic service learning coursework on USM's, uh, on USM students' pre-existing environmental attitudes. In seeking to assess the collective impact of the ASL experience on pre-existing environmental attitudes, we imagine that our findings might inform internal faculty discussions concerning the development of new degree plans or modifications to the university's existing general education curriculum to bring either or both curricular initiatives more in line with the planned coastal reorganization. We also anticipated that our findings would contribute to the body of literature identifying the positive impacts of environmental service learning coursework on students and campus community connections. According to the annually published results of Campus Compact's 30-year survey of membership institutions, which took place from 1986 to 2016, environmentally focused coursework constitutes a significant portion of academic service learning being implemented at institutions of higher education. For example, in 2016, the last year from which survey results were published, 82% of the responding institutions reported working with community partner organizations whose primary mission focused on environmental and or sustainability issues. With regard to the positive impacts of environmental service learning in higher education, scholars have highlighted the collective contribution of environmental community service hours, as well as the strengthened bonds between uh, local communities, college campuses, and participating students on matters of sustainability and place-based environmental stewardship. 
Kelly and Abel in 2012 also theorized that environmental service learning in curricular and co-curricular contexts could help foster ecological citizenship, and that's their term. McFall in 2012 also noted positive long-term impacts of service learning based capstone course projects on graduating environmental studies majors, and Damaris, Furker, and Iller in 2020 observed that the development of science communication skills, as well as increased feelings of gratitude and satisfaction, were the result of having an opportunity to engage in authentic science content relevant to their community needs. However, in assessing the positive impacts of environmental service learning on undergraduate students, nearly all researchers have presented qualitative rather than quantitative assessments. This is due at least in part to the fact that the small size of experimental groups in many cases has made it difficult to demonstrate statistically significant improvements in pre-existing environmental attitudes um, among the service learning uh, student groups. By aggregating data from environmental service learning courses taught across, across the curriculum at USM during the 2021 and 2022 academic years, uh, the present study addresses this previously identified research gap. Uh, using a single pretest, post-test survey instrument described in further detail below, we have assessed the collective impact of environmentally focused service learning coursework on the pre-existing environmental attitudes of a number of key student demographics at USM. These include general education students, pre-service English and language arts teachers at both the primary and secondary levels, and senior level capstone students. Several recurring themes in the literature on environmental attitudes, or EA research, informed our decision to adopt a previously validated survey instrument for our quantitative assessment. First, in light of the fact that the replicability of studies helps strengthen and solidify the expansive and diverse body of research on environmental attitudes, we adopted to use a previously validated survey instrument. At the same time, however, the concern that Dunlap and Jones in 2003 expressed over the fact that a number of longstanding EA survey instruments were becoming dated encouraged us to adopt the most recent previously validated instrument we could find. Based on these considerations, we elected to use Milfont and Duckett's Environmental Attitudes Inventory from 2010. It is the most current and comprehensive self-report instrument to assess environmental attitudes. As a practical consideration, the fact that the brief version of the EAI features a mere 24 questions was an added draw for us. Especially in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we worried that an overly lengthy survey instrument might disincentivize student participation in the study. So the data collected uh, commenced in fall 2020 and continued through spring 2022. Uh, and the results presented here and today reflect the data collected from the fall and spring semesters of both academic years. And before we direct your attention to those results, we want to give you a basic sense of what environmentally focused service learning coursework looked like in the courses that we surveyed, especially um, in the case of the qualitative evidence as it relates to pre-service teacher education at the primary and secondary levels. So we actually surveyed a total of uh, 17 sections of service learning courses um, in uh, the course of the two years. Uh, these included both general education courses at the lower level, which you can see in the above grouping, and upper division courses, which were geared primarily toward uh, pre-service teacher candidates um, uh, at the lower in the lower grouping here. So these included courses notably from the natural and environmental sciences, um, as well as the humanities, arts, and science and math education. And I'll turn it over to Rachel, who will introduce one of our courses. Hi, I'm Rachel Geisweit, and I taught um, service learning to my students that are in SME 432, um, which is called Science for Elementary Teachers. This course is a science methods course that's required by elementary education majors, regardless of their intended endorsement area. So that's really important because many of my students came into the class really not intending to teach science. Um, not with a very strong background in science, but having to take it as a requirement of their degree in order to graduate. So um, when thinking about teaching students in this very practical major, as we all know, it's important to model appropriate instructional strategies and engage these future teachers in the content knowledge that they need in order to become effective teachers. 
So this is particularly important, important in science methods classes because we know that in elementary grades, these students, uh, um, as they become teachers, will spend very little time actually teaching science. So um, even more importantly than that, though, climate science is not explicitly mentioned within the national or state elementary science standards. However, we know that our teachers are not only stewards of their classroom and community, they're also stewards of the earth and their local environment. So what's tricky about this lack of emphasis of climate science in the elementary science standards is that we know that younger children, um, when exposed to this type of concept, find it easier to build on this information as they grow into productive members of their community. Um, but we did find an interesting entry point in the elementary science standards that we decided to take advantage of when engaging them in the service learning project, which is HEAT. HEAT is a part of elementary science standards. So that was one of our focuses in, and one of my focuses in SME 432. Next slide. So with service learning, you usually um, partner with a service learning community partner. And so to ensure that my students were ready to teach about climate science, because that was the chosen theme for my um, students, we began working with our service learning community partner, 2C Mississippi. This was important for my class because 2C Mississippi has boots on the ground. They're in their community doing work, um, service work to educate and inform residents of Mississippi on climate science issues. And then through this partnership, we engaged in several conversations with the CEO, Dr. Dominica Perry, to determine what they did within the organization and what needs they had. 2C Mississippi had already been developing um, some middle grades climate science lesson plans um, because that's the age that climate science is really introduced in the standards. But they were interested in developing a curriculum that would get climate science into the elementary classrooms to begin this discussion at a younger age. So that was the culminating project for my students um, through the engagement in the service learning activity. Next. Because my students do not typically have a strong science background, it was really necessary for us to first build that content knowledge um, because we, if we had an expectation for them to develop effective curriculum, they needed to really understand it first. And so to do this, we spent a lot of time working with various climate um, science content through different resources, like um, NASA has a lot of great information, obviously, and other um, resources engaging in several hands-on activities. Even in fall of 2020, when our courses were completely online, we still made an effort to do hands-on activities, which I'll describe to you a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, and you can see some of the key concepts and targeted service learning activities that we engaged in here. Um, and I will describe a few of them as we move on. Next. One activity we engaged in during the fall of 2020 when they were completely online was Project Bud Burst, which you all may be familiar with already. That they, our students used this um, citizen science tool to monitor pollinators in their community and record what they saw. This is a variation of the phenology project that Chris and I did with our students in fall of 2021, which he will discuss later. Um, but the goal of this project was for students to be mindful of their surroundings, observe the pollinators during fall when the population numbers begin to decrease in the area, and to begin to make the connections between heat, flowering periods, and pollinator activity. Next. Not shown here, but connected, Chris and I in our separate classes involved our students in an individual embodied mindfulness and reflection experience. So for the, well, a few of them, but for the first one, the students were directed to spend one minute on a sidewalk, road, or parking lot that was exposed to direct sunlight. During that timed minute, the students were directed to focus solely on their embodied sensation of direct exposure to sunlight during the late summer months. And in South Mississippi, believe me, it gets very hot <laughs> if you do not know. Um, and then immediately following that one minute, they were instructed to seek out the nearest tree shaded location and spend the next minute similarly focused on their embodied sensations um, sheltered from the direct sunlight by tree coverage. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, to extend that activity, activity um, shown here, students in my class uh, did an activity that I called um, Help Backyard Birds Beat the Heat, where they were given two natural wooden birdhouses to investigate the impact of the albedo effect. They were to paint the roof of one birdhouse white and the other black. Once dry, the students took the birdhouses outside and used handheld infrared thermometers to take an initial temperature of both the inside of the birdhouses and the birdhouse roof. 
And then um, some students pl placed their birdhouses in direct sunlight, some of them placed it in shade, and they took a second reading after 30 minutes in the same location after they had been sitting out. We did this together as a class in the fall of 2021, but during um, our remote year, uh, semester, I actually had these materials either sent to them or they came and picked them up, um, observing COVID protocols, of course, and they did it at home um, while we were together on a live Zoom call. And at the conclusion of these activities, students were prompted to reflect on their experiences and to make meaningful connections between and among their individual embodied experiences and the albedo effect experiment. And we will discuss some of those results later. Next. Okay, so now I'll give you uh, some sense of what uh, my capstone course for English and English education majors look like in the fall of 20 and fall of 2021. Um, and it, and particularly in the fall of 2021, um, as Rachel just suggested, uh, she and I spent a lot of time um, aligning um, our curricula in each of our respective courses, uh, in part because we both worked with 2C Mississippi as, as a community partner. Um, and we'll say more about that um, in a few moments. But for this particular course, um, it was focused on contemporary world literature and film. Uh, and in e each of the fall 20 and fall 21 semesters, uh, there was a, a particular emphasis on climate justice concerns, both within our region and beyond. Um, here were uh, the community partners that I worked, that my class worked with over the course of these two years, um, the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, 2C Mississippi, um, Plastic Free Gulf Coast, and Climate Change Theater Action. Um, uh, my students um, approaching uh, climate justice concerns from a humanities or literature and film perspective um, came at some of these activities, hands-on experiential learning activities from a different angle, but, but we were able to sort of, uh, both Rachel and I, uh, direct our students to focus on some of these key issues as they relate to our particular region. Uh, so one of the uh, experiential learning activities that, that our students did in the fall of 2021 was we toured a local phenology trail and we tracked butterfly migrations, uh, and my students in particular, uh, using the citizen science app Journey North. Uh, this was connected to uh, Barbara King Solver's novel, The Flight Behavior, uh, which is also set in the Gulf South region uh, broadly. Uh, speaking and also um, draws readers' attentions to butterfly populations and their vulnerabilities uh, in the face of a changing climate. Uh, so we were able to connect this activity uh, to the literature through that particular angle. Uh, and Rachel also mentioned um, the mindfulness um, activity related to heat and shade. So, so my students performed the same uh, embodied reflective activity where they sat uh, for one minute on a hot sidewalk or in the parking lot and then moved to the shade. Uh, and then my students uh, in, in a subsequent activity, um, and Rachel's students did this as well, we had the students take temperature readings of four different locations on campus. One of them was the middle of a tennis court. Uh, the second place was a bench that had tree covering for part of the day, but not all of the day. Uh, the third place was a chimney pavilion, which was largely shaded throughout the day. And then we also had them take the temperature reading of an outside wall of our campus library. Again, uh, that was shaded partially, um, and at other times of the day, it was not shaded. And we aggregated the data that our two respective classrooms collected. Uh, and then we invited the students to analyze that data and reflect on some of their insights. And ultimately, what we wanted to do was connect um, the students' data collection and analysis to climate justice concerns. Um, and we know that um, there's a, a high spatial coincidence of red line districts uh, in cities throughout the United States and urban heat islands. And so we were really directing our attention, our students' attention to uh, what is an urban heat island, where are urban heat islands located, and why is this a climate justice concern? Um, and ultimately, um, we were able to connect 
these learning experiences to an initiative that 2C Mississippi has worked on uh, in the city of Jackson, Mississippi, which was first and foremost mapping urban heat islands in the city and then developing uh, green infrastructure initiatives to mitigate the urban heat island effect, um, in particular to uh, mitigate uh, climate injustices uh, that are on, on the ground. And there are many, of course, in Jackson, Mississippi right now. Uh, but that is um, how Rachel and I approached um, uh, aligning our curriculum, uh, particularly in working with 2C Mississippi and focusing on regional climate um, justice concerns uh, in the Gulf South region. So we'll turn now to the quantitative analysis. So this, this is not just these two courses, uh, I'll remind you all, but it's, it's all of the 17 different sections of environmental service learning coursework uh, that was delivered at the University of Southern Mississippi uh, from fall 2020 to spring 2022. Um, we delivered the, the EAI brief version of the survey instrument. Uh, and here is a sense of the two groups that we surveyed. So a control group of students were enrolled in a general education psychology course. So these were freshmen and sophomores largely from across the university, um, any number of majors. Um, they represent the general student population. And we surveyed this student population once to get a baseline sense of what uh, at least the sample students' um, environmental attitudes look like. There were 198 participants in this control group, and we compared this baseline test to the post-test results of the experimental group uh, who completed uh, the EAI survey at the end of the term, okay? Um, there were 143 students um, who comprised that experimental group, uh, and we had, again, the EAI survey instrument, which was on a seven-point Likert scale. Uh, and here is, uh, to give you some sense of the EAI, um, there are 24 questions. Two of the questions, uh, two questions each, are devoted to each of these 12 subscales. So enjoyment of nature, support for interventionist conservation policies, environmental movement activism, uh, altering nature, personal conservation behavior, human dominance over nature, and so on and so forth. Uh, these break down into two different uh, second orders, one of which is focused on ecological preservation, uh, and another of which is focused on human utilization. And we've actually seen very positive changes among the service learning students compared to the baseline uh, in both of these um, second orders. So, um, in 10 of the 12 subscales, we have seen uh, statistically significant differences between the post-test scores of the service learning students and the baseline control group students. Uh, so you can see here um, the, the first half of these um, and those that are uh, highlighted in boxes are where we see statistically significant differences. Uh, those that are uh, coded in green we see a statistically significant increase in the average scores of the service learning group. And all of these that are coded green, I would note are um, associated with that preservationist factor of the second order. So uh, this is ecological preservation. So students are gaining a greater appreciation for ecological um, preservation uh, along enjoyment of nature, environmental movement, activism, uh, the perception of threat to the environment, personal conservation behavior, ecocentric concern, and support for population growth policies. Uh, those that are coded in red, we, we see a statistically significant decrease in the average scores, and all of these are grouped with the utilization factor. So uh, essentially, um, how are students perceiving uh, nature as uh, something that can be utilized for human benefit. And so we're seeing a, a decrease in that kind of motivation among the service learning students. So conservation motivated by anthropocentric concern, altering nature, human dominance over nature, and human utilization of nature. All of these scores are significantly lower among the post-test results for the service learning students. Uh, so if we summarize these results, uh, the service learning students uh, find more enjoyment 
in nature and outdoor activities. They're more supportive of environmental movement activism. They are more worried about environmental risks. The same students are also less likely to support altering nature for human ends. Uh, they believe less in the dominance of humans over nature, uh, and uh, they are less motivated by anthropocentric concern and a desire to use uh, natural resources for human benefit only. Uh, They're also more likely uh, to be motivated to preserve nature, uh, and they show more ecocentric concern uh, than the baseline student population at the university. Okay, and I'll turn it over to Rachel for the qualitative analysis. Okay, <clears throat> so for this part of the study, we were interested in the influence of academic service learning on pre-service teachers' professional development and capacity for encouraging co-created community-driven science in their future classrooms. All courses in the study required students to keep a semester-long service learning journal featuring assigned reflection prompts at various intervals throughout the semester. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? For the purpose of um, this research project, we have analyzed one representative service learning journal from each course included in the study, an end of term reflection concerning the semester long academic service learning experience for fall 2020 students and a midterm service learning journal entry from fall 2021, which specific specifically prompted students to reflect on the interrelated experiential heat activities that we previously described. So we conducted a thematic analysis using deductive coding. Um, through our coding process, we agreed upon the following final themes reflected in the data. The first uh, was an increased sense of civic engagement. Second, an indication of pre-service teachers' future curriculum plans. Third, recognition of the experiential value of working with community partners. Fourth, increased knowledge of the fundamental scientific principles related to heat and climate change. And fifth, uh, sorry, fifth, the influence of embodied learning for each individual student. And then finally, sixth, a heightened recognition of the social, so racial, socioeconomic, geographic, et cetera, dimensions of climate change impacts in the Gulf South, South region. In an early discussion of the coding results, we repeatedly detected an emergent theme of increased climate literacy. So using the um, definition that you can see on this slide from the US Global Change Research Program, we saw repeated common threads in our data indicating our students were becoming more climate literate through, this was very interesting, the interweaving of the increased scientific literacy that resulted from the embodied experiences and led to also further understanding of social dimensions of climate change impact. So we saw those three themes linked together was really what brought um, about the most evidence of increased climate, science, um, climate literacy. So I will now highlight some student quotes to discuss these themes. Next slide. And um, they're very wordy. So I just tried to highlight some of the big <laughs> words that would help. Um, but you can see um, just as one example of some of the um, quotes that we saw in the reflective journals uh, to, to evidence scientific literacy, the student no noticed places um, surrounded by greenery that have lower temperatures, even when they're not shaded. So they're starting to piece together the content knowledge that they're learning. They talked about um, differences in uh, distance uh, versus degrees. Um, they talked about the birdhouse experiment um, that showed the different impacts that colors can have on the temperatures and the outdoor sensations and so on. So the student's response indicated the clearest increase in scientific literacy grounded in the experiential learning activities performed to highlight urban heat island effect and the albedo effect for students. And in this quote, um, the fact that the student's reflection was prompted by the mindfulness exercise really underscores the interconnected nature of increased scientific literacy and embodied learning for our pre-service teacher population. We see this again in the following quote, obviously under embodied learning, um, where the students uh, made meaning of the content through, through comparing themselves to birds which is really what we were hoping that they would do um, and, and what it might be like to live in a birdhouse. So then they extend this idea of a bird living in a birdhouse to themselves living in their own house to other people in the community that are living in houses that may or may not be like theirs and um, what experiences those people have. So 
uh, that quote, comparing myself to the birds that will hopefully live in the birdhouses we painted, I feel sorry for the ones that must take shelter in the blacktop houses. And then they're talking about how, um, uh, and I tried to highlight a little based on the colors. You can see there's an interweaving here of them talking about their own embodied experiences to the scientific literacy, to the social dimensions. Um, they talk about how white top houses make for a more feasible living situation and, um, and that sort of thing. So extending from this, we saw an increased awareness of the relationship between the systemic oppression and climate change found in our data. One student even referenced a need to care for vulnerable community members in the peak of extreme heat we experience in the South, quoting, and quote, in uh, these areas, there is a homeless population that could greatly benefit from cooling centers in the summer, end quote. Um, and then we also saw, uh, obviously, inc uh, increase of understanding or awareness of social dimension on climate change. And um, the social dimensions of climate change also increased the student's perspective of personal responsibility and respect for climate change in conjunction with increased scientific literacy and embodied learning. So as such, we really note that this is an important component of climate literacy to spur a personal conviction that may lead to action. Um, next slide. We also had students reporting an increased sense of civic engagement through their experiences in the service learning community partnership. And perhaps more importantly, there were several journal entries where the students went beyond a sense of engagement and took tangible action. So here you can see a student talking about how they um, had discussed what they learned with their family um, and friends. And so we you know, call this the trickle down effect. And that's really exciting for us to see because when they're sharing this newfound perspective and knowledge base with family members, just imagine how this trickle down can turn into a stream when these students are teachers in their own classroom. So it was really exciting to see. And that was just one really good example from those reflections. Next slide. The students' um, reflections indicated that a number of students felt an increased sense of confidence in their future teaching careers, often in relation to climate literacy or increased familiarity with readiness standards and lesson plan development. And you can see here, um, there are just several um, mentions of feeling like it was more interesting, more exciting, and they think that that's what kids need in the classroom. Um, and several mentioned they plan to use it in the classroom. And so, um, and you can see in these quotes that the students um, noting that engagement, an important component of science learning, it made it worth remembering for their future teaching practices. So that was really exciting. Um, and then the, and I'm trying to hurry because I know we're running out of time. So I apologize for rushing through this. Um, the last example demonstrates an understanding of the connection between embodied uh, learning and scientific literacy to make sense of climate change. This pre-service teacher also reflects on the notion that engaging in inquiry activities, co-creating knowledge within their community and reflecting on the overall experience can influence perspective and be an impetus for action. Next slide. They were very excited to work with the community partners and they were actively engaged with them throughout the experience, throughout the courses. In the service learner, learning journal entries, the students repeatedly exclaimed the value of working with the community partners where they professed as one example an increased understanding of just really the reality of climate change. Um, and you can see in this first quote, I did not highlight this, but this is really telling of many students in our area where it says living in the conservative South, no one really talks about climate change. And when they do, it's usually about how it's fake. So I never paid much attention to the topic. And so it's really exciting to um, see them then reflect on how working with the community service learning partner made um, it really a real reality to them and helped them to see what they can do within their own classroom and in their lives. Um, and so that quote also acknowledges then, of course, a potential obstacle for students that live in regional areas that tend to identify as among the least believing members of global warming. And they have grown up in these Southern communities experiencing the impact of climate change without knowing the term or cause. We were unfortunately fortunate, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, um, to have also gone through hurricanes during the, both semesters. Um, and so the students were really able to relate to those experiences of Hurricane um, Ida and Zeta in relation to global warming as well. 
Um, we saw an, an additional trend um, increased sense of empowerment against climate change as a result of positive interaction with community partner. And one student's example explains that these interactions resulted in an increased um, literacy engagement and the desire to act, um, which you can see in the second quote. And what's clear uh, from the examples and the students are that they're less likely to take action against issues that they don't know that much about but the, to be able to work with the experts and the experts being willing to work with them and excited to work with them, um, and working with them as peers, teaching them the content really made them feel um, like that content just came more alive and was more relevant and, and exciting for them. And then um, <clears throat> a final trend we identified in our students' work was use, uh, using their increased climate literacy and drive for action to take initiative to exceed the surface level understanding of the community partners mission. This last quote was exciting for us to see because they say they went back to an assignment that Chris had assigned to the students. And, you know, who does that really? Like our students are not known for really kind of going back and reviewing things, um, but something that they were doing in the class triggered them. You know what? I need to go back and reread that article. And they wanted to see what connections could be made between Brenda's words and the article that they read and the related activities that they were doing in class. So that's very exciting. Um, and it, this quote, I think, also highlights the potential for students in these partnerships to have the knowledge and skills to apply this knowledge in other situations, but also take personal initiative to continue research to build bridges between concepts or justify conclusions that they have. Next. All right, so I know that we are rapidly running out of time, so I'm just gonna run through the conclusion. Um, I mentioned uh, at the start that there was an institutional reorganization that prompted this study, um, and, and we hoped that the findings, or at least the initial findings of our study would um, inspire faculty uh, to um, have conversations about incorporating academic service learning into the academic curriculum in alignment with this institutional reorganization. Um, I'm happy to report that we have um, developed a new BA program in sustainability studies and a BS program in sustainability sciences. Um, there's also a, a Gulf Scholars Certificate Program, uh, which is still in the process of being developed, but it's going to be grounded in general education coursework that engages with um, coastal uh, resilience issues uh, in, the, in the Gulf Coast region. And then um, in particular, um, the um, inspiration that the that both my students who are again English education pre-service teacher candidates and Rachel students uh, who are elementary school pre-service teacher candidates uh, their their commitment to uh, incorporating um, academic service learning and environmentally focused subjects uh, and lesson plans in their own classrooms moving forward has really inspired um, us to to sort of bring on, uh, those students as, as collaborators really in this uh, new initiative that we have uh, going on now. Uh, it's a Mississippi Gulf Coast Environmental Justice STEM Leadership Development Program. Uh, this is a curriculum that's being developed by USM faculty and service learning students, um, and it's being delivered in um, after-school programs at the Boys and Girls Clubs of the Gulf Coast uh, and the STEPS Coalition, an environmental justice nonprofit along the Mississippi Gulf Coast, has really been a central coordinator in the, the development of this grant-funded program. Uh, I became connected through the STEPS Coalition through my work with the community partner organization, the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy. Um, and so... Uh, these community partner organization connections that both Rachel and I have established uh, have really inspired uh, this, this subsequent work. Uh, to give you some sense of, of this um, after-school program, uh, we are focusing each year on an individual theme uh, that can be connected to climate and environmental justice concerns in the Gulf Coast region. Um, our first theme this year is urban heat island mapping. In future years, we anticipate looking at coastal flooding and sea level rise, air quality testing and analysis, and water quality testing and analysis. Ultimately, these will be um, community-driven curriculum uh, that faculty and USM students uh, will work together to, to co-create. Uh, and I'll leave it at that, and hopefully we have a few, few minutes for questions.
Thank you, Carrie, for dropping that in the chat. Um, so uh, Zoomcast um, asks, did you get any pushback from locals in these communities? I wonder um, if you, so. This is like not in favor of discussion of these topics. Um, hmm. uh, so I'll just, um, Rachel, do you want to take this question or do you want me to? I can. If you want. Okay, go ahead. And then I'll. For I'll my students specifically, so in this sort of phase of development of this project, it was really about working with our students specifically to develop curriculum that could then go out um, statewide and then potentially nationwide, as um, Dominica Perry has quite a lot of connections uh, that she can share the resources with once they're well developed. And so we, we were not necessarily engaging much with people within the community at that level, but we are kind of um, going to that now. I will say in this new phase, uh, everybody is self-selecting participants. And so there's no real pushback there, but within our, um, within our student, within our classes, our students, when they enrolled in our classes, they did it strictly because it was re a required um, part of their degree program, and they did not know that it was going to be a service learning class or that it would be environmentally based, because we know that we can teach science methods without it being strictly like, let's talk about climate science, and obviously the same would be true for um, an English literature class. So uh, our students had, you know, they, they initially were um, some, were very excited, some were just whatever, and some did express like, I'm, and I'm not sure that this was really for me, but that, you know, stick with it because that was uh, what was needed for their class. Um, interesting though, because our, our results ended up uh, so good, at, you know, between the pre and post in comparison to our control group. So ultimately it was good for them, but their their pushback really wasn't from the community. It was just some of the students that were surprised that they had to do something like this. And I would add that um, the first time I taught an environmental literature course at, at USM, my students readily admitted on day one that they had not ever really even thought about environmental issues, um, didn't care about them, didn't think about them. Uh, but by the end of the term, the students, their concerns around the environment um, globally were raised. Uh, but in the end of term student comments, they noted that they were unclear about how it connected to their everyday lives in Mississippi. And so that's actually that those kinds of comments were what prompted me to rethink some of the curriculum. And ultimately, I decided that um, academic service learning was the best vehicle for delivering uh, environmental content to the students because it provided local connections for them. Um, so, so, you know, how does this relate to where they live um, and their everyday lives now and in the future? Um, by um, working with local and regional community partners, uh, the connections are more explicitly made for the students throughout the term. Um, uh, um, I detect in that question also an element of different factions, right? So, um, you know, local, there, there are many different diverse groups that make up local and regional communities in the Gulf South, and there's a lot of divide across race and across class. And for me, um, working with community partner organizations was a, a key way to bridge the campus community divide. Um, and to get our students, who are frankly predominantly and disproportionately white, to consider these environmental and social justice issues in frameworks that move beyond just, you know, how they might otherwise think about and approach these issues from their own, you know, situated um, identities at the intersection of race and class in Mississippi, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. There's another question where most of your students from Mississippi, did you see a significant change between pre-service teachers, pre-test and post-test scores, or did you only compare post-test to the control group? 
I will say, at least for the sake of my students, most of them were from Mississippi. There were a few military spouses that had been traveling with their spouse, but for the most part, um, almost all of mine were from Mississippi. Um, the, the same is true. Uh, we're a, a largely commuter campus in uh, Long Beach, Mississippi. Uh, there are no dorms on campus, so you know pretty much the entire um, student population is is within driving distance. So some of them might be in you know Louisiana at the border of Mississippi or Alabama, but we're you know ninety five to ninety nine percent of the students are from this particular um, coastal stretch of a hundred or so miles. Um, uh, and then in response to Dylan's question, um, the second part, did you see a significant change uh, between pretest and post-test scores? And, and we haven't communicated those findings in this particular presentation, but we do see statistically significant increases in, uh, I believe it's three out of the 12 constructs. And one of those, I think importantly to note is environmental movement activism. Uh, and there is some literature, particularly uh, in relation to um, recovery efforts following the BP, um, a deep, deep water horizon oil spill in 2010, that um, perceptions around uh, environmental threat and um, ecocentric concern are, are major motivating factors in recovery efforts even more so than disaster impact itself. And so, you know, I think that in particular, the, the fact that we are seeing increased commitments to um, environmental movement activism uh, is a really good thing. We, we kind of expect that from service learning anyway, which is, you know, well-documented to increase civic engagement, but particularly on the coast and particularly in relation to uh, future disaster recovery efforts and the goal of building long-term coastal resilience. We see this as one of the really positive findings um, in, in our study so far. Carrie Roach asks, um, are you connected with the Gulf South for the Green New Deal or Taproot? And um, uh, both Rachel and I have attended Gulf South for the Green New Deal meetings. Um, and in fall of 2020, when my students partnered with um, the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, um, which I believe has since rebranded as Taproot, um, they they did work uh, in some ways, uh, and and they uh, on the Gulf South for the Green New Deal project. But they they also worked really with the Gulf South for the Green New, De or I'm sorry, uh, the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy on the development of an after school curriculum that could be delivered in the boys in organizations like the Boys and Girls Club within the community. Um, and so. Um, while the work that those students doing or the work that those students did in the classroom was not directly connected to Gulf South for the Green New Deal initiatives in fall of 2020, it's certainly related to that and it's related to the organizational missions of, of that particular coalition. I hope that answered your question sufficiently, Carrie. If you're in the Gulf South, you should check it out for sure. Yes. And uh, they have, um, yes, state hubs for each of the Gulf South states. So Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. And um, uh, okay. Um, Carrie, can you tell me what that acronym stands for? Um, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, it's the Bureau of Ocean Energy uh, Management. And um, we had a deadline to meet as far as testifying if we want um, new uh, uh, leases or not. So okay, uh, that um, would really be pushing it, I understand. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I'm just asking, I'm not judging. Yeah. I appreciate the question. Um, I'll Thank say you. from from my perspective, my understanding of that particular initiative that that's been kind of the last 
you know, one to two quarters of the calendar year, so summer into fall. Um, and I'm actually on sabbatical this fall, so I'm not teaching my customary service learning capstone course. Um, we might have uh, engaged with some of that. I've certainly, um, the first iteration of this class in fall 2020 was entitled Energy Infrastructures and the Environment in Contemporary World Literature and Film. Um, and it, it very much grappled with energy humanities and environmental humanities questions in relation to, to climate justice in the region. So um, I wouldn't necessarily require my students to sign you know, that kind of petition, but I, I certainly wouldn't be um, uh, opposed to putting that before them and asking them what they think about that in terms of um, their own perspectives on it. Yeah, well, um, you could you could testify whatever you wanted. I mean, it was just uh, a you know, it was a public hearing for them to know that they could be engaged either way. You know. Um, yeah. Thank, so thank you. Thank you. That, yeah. thank you. I'll, I'll put a, a link to it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, I think um, if there are no further questions, uh, from what I understand, there's an important keynote coming up, right? So we don't want to stay too long in, in this space. But um, if there are any other questions, I think Rachel and I would be happy to field them in the next couple of minutes. And thank you all for attending. We'd love to hear from you at any time. Chris, is our uh, contact info? It's there? probably not. I'll, I'll, I'll drop have. my email in the chat and Rachel will do the same. All right, looks like we're out, out of questions. So thanks everyone for yeah. attending and have a great rest of the conference.